We acknowledge the Yuggera and Ghana nations as traditional custodians of the land on which we work, live and learn, and their continuing connection with the land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their elders past and present. All content related to this program is for general informational purposes only and contains stories and discussion around mental health that may be disturbing to some listeners. If you are concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional and individual advice and support. More details are contained in our show notes. Music can act as a doorway into your memories. There was the case that we wrote about where a woman with severe dementia developed what we call Capgras syndrome or delusion, where she assumed that her husband of 60 years was an intruder and would chase him out of the house with a broom. But then he started singing a song that they shared together when they first met. And through that, she started to recognize him again and and her memories returned. But he had to sing that song to her uh, basically every night and remind her that he was her husband of 60 years. And in his words, she came back. That's Professor Bill Thompson, Department of Psychology and Director of the Music, Sound and Performance Lab at Macquarie University. And this is Reframe of Mind where we deep dive into discussions about mental health, joined by some of Australia's leading minds to expand our understanding of the world and ourselves. Because we don't exist in a vacuum, and the way we talk about mental health shouldn't either. We're your hosts, Andy Leroy and Louise Poole. Ah, music. I can't imagine not enjoying it. You know, I'm really glad I'm not part of the 3% of people who suffer from music anhedonia. Huh? (laughs) Huh? What? (laughs) Andy, big words again. Come on, break that down. I don't know what that is. All right, so music and anhedonia is a neurological condition where people don't derive any pleasure from music. Can you imagine? None at all. None. None. Sad now, and it's only the start of the episode. (laughs) Well, let's fix that, hey? So let's just skip back a little bit and and just recall last time we had a bit more of a deep dive into decision-making because, well, we'd all like to think we're pretty clear-headed when making choices, there are lots of factors that can influence the choices we make from day to day or even from moment to moment. Yeah, we've been speaking to some pretty clever people from the areas of research and neuroscientists, and what we've started to see, or hear, was a theme about the importance of music, not only with mood, but in how it can create a shortcut in our minds and make an impact on our thinking strategies. Miran Irish, a cognitive neuropsychologist at the Brain and Mind Centre at the University of Sydney, explains. One of the things I was thinking about with music then is that sometimes a song can kind of act as a shortcut, uh, I suppose, and maybe that's a shortcut in the brain as well with a new neural pathway. So I'm wondering if we can, could we consciously create those? You know, you, you hear a song, it instantly reminds you of that time that you felt good getting married. Could we consciously try and associate one type of cue to elicit that response? It's definitely possible. And there's a a large literature on this idea of conditioning, where you gradually pair one stimulus with another outcome or response so that over time it becomes a sort of an automatic, automatic or reflexive response. Whether we could actually consciously do this and then make sure that our response was the same every time, I'm not so sure because people change and, you know, our feelings change from one moment to the next. And we might hear, you know, the wedding song on one day, but be in a particularly bad mood with your spouse and then think, oh, God, I, you know, I can't believe I loved <laughs> dancing to this. It's, we're, we're so variable that it's it's very hard to predict you know, hard and fast kind of set of rules that we could roll out um, across all contexts. Now, both Andy and I have been music directors for commercial radio stations in our past lives, which is the person who's responsible for playing the same 300 songs that you've heard over and over again in a different order every day (laughs) on the radio. Yeah, believe it or not, the jocks aren't actually choosing their own songs. No. And I have to say that programming music specials, although sometimes really frustrating and laborious, was actually also a complete joy. Uh, Would you explain that oxymoron? What did you call me? (laughs) Wow. Okay. All right. So what I mean is that when I was selecting the tunes for the special, which could be anything from our feature to an all-day event. Oh, hello, All Ladies Friday. Yeah, hello. And (laughs) so what would happen is I'd get a little burst inside of my brain of that tune as I was programming it. So... Mm. 
if I was programming Cindy Lauper for All Ladies Friday, for example, mm-hmm. you can bet your bottom dollar that I was getting a little burst of girls just want to have fun racing through the corridors of my brain. And that gave me that little you know, warm, fuzzy connection that I experience every time I actually listen to the tune. I bet it was that bit at the start. Oh, I love that. That wasn't even a good <laughs> that's not that's a terrible impersonation of that. <laughs> Awful. If Cindy Lauper ever listened, I'm sure she'd go, guys, guys, no. <laughs> so where Stop do you it. think the frustration comes in then if you enjoyed that? Well, in the end, I think, you know, even though I'm getting these little bursts, when you're working as a music director, the songs are just data. I know, right? Buzzkill. Yeah. Eventually and- they just become numbers on a screen. It's like I mean, I'm surprised you didn't enjoy it more. It's a lot like a spreadsheet. It is a little bit, and I did get a little bit of pleasure out of that. But in the end, if you're looking at music and it just becomes numbers, then, you know, because you can't have too much of a jump in tempo or mood. And uh, imagine, just for a minute, if you leapt too quickly from Leanne Rhymes to ACDC. Mm, my ears are bleeding just at the thought of it. <laughs> um, but fake injuries aside, this theme of music and how it affects our decisions seem like something worth looking at because neither of us suffer music anhedonia. Anhedonia, well done. Yeah! Yay! Uh, But our love for music is as good an excuse of any to explore the impacts and benefits it has on the brain in our reframing journey. Because as it turns out, music's value lies beyond just entertainment. Music is much more than mere entertainment. It can it can have profound effects on individuals and on society. That's Professor Bill Thompson from Macquarie University, and we are meeting him for the first time in this episode, so it might be good to give a bit of background, hey? Well, Bill's an accomplished academic, having studied and worked in Canada and Stockholm before working at the Conservatorium of Music Research Centre in Sydney, and then being appointed to his current position at Macquarie University as the director of the Music Sound and Performance Lab. Yeah, and Bill hasn't just studied in the fields of communication, culture and information. He's also composed and performed music for film, theatre and radio. It sounds like Bill's living my best life. (laughs) (laughs) He wasn't my both. Um, He's got a keen interest, obviously, in how the mind works and he's got a particular interest in the cognitive, emotional, social and cultural implications of music. So Mm -hmm. it's been a bit of a walk, but we got Mm -hmm. here. Our music-free music special where we (laughs) chat musical creativity, music and emotion, music and the imagination, and even the use of music as treatment for neurological disorders such as dementia, which crosses over nicely with Mirren's field of interest. But let's not jump the gun because we started by chatting to Bill about our own relationship to music. One of my roles was as a music director for a radio station for eight odd years. And um, I've seen a lot of data when it comes to what people like to listen to. And reading your stuff yesterday put a lot of the whys into perspective as well on. So when we say things, you know, like people like music from their formative years, I got it, how it's affecting the brain and why they like that music instead of just looking at the data. So this is going to be really interesting. Yeah, it's it's uh, been an interesting journey for me as well, um, you know, for many decades looking at music and how it affects us personally and psychologically and our moods and our memories. And I've certainly been introduced to music that I never thought I was going to be introduced to, like death metal and, you know, genres that that were not my thing necessarily, but I really wanted to understand. So it's been interesting. It's actually interesting because uh, one of the bands that was mentioned in one of your papers, we actually obviously Googled yesterday when we were reading about it, and neither of us became fans. <laughs> Don't tell me it was Cannibal it Corpse. It was Cannibal Corpse. <laughs> <laughs> and no offence to the guys, but not my cup of tea. Well, do you know, um, you know, the mere exposure effect in psychology is that if you're exposed to something for long enough, you really start to appreciate it. And I have to say, after hearing this song about 30 times, I started to appreciate Hammer Smashed Face, which is one of the top songs of Cannibal Corpse. <laughs> and uh, they're an interesting band in, in many ways that, uh, that are kind of unexpected. I'm not a fan, but I understand what they're doing and I appreciate it. That study in particular is really interesting because when we read about your work about looking at music in the brain, our first thought was, what about what about heavy metal or what about songs that we don't like? So if music elevates our emotion, then what's happening when it comes to songs like 
that. So to read that it impacts some people positively is unexpected. Well, I'm really glad that you said that it was unexpected because one of the one of the responses that we got from fans of extreme metal music was, you know, duh, we like it because, you know, we like it. And what did you expect that we would end up, you know, feeling terrible? Of course, we feel empowered, we feel joyful, we enjoy this music. But I think your feeling of being, you know, surprised is shared by a lot of people. When you've got music that explicitly depicts violence in the lyrics, often violence against women, there doesn't seem to be a, like a Shakespeare type narrative. It's not you know, it doesn't seem poetic. It just seems to be screaming out these violent depictions. So a lot of people are worried. There are a lot of, uh, kind of understandably, they're thinking, well, is this really good for my teenage son to be listening to? And I think that the answer is actually kind of complicated and it depends on the person. So for most people, they just love the energy, they get empowered, they feel joyful, they love the underground nature of it and the outsider kind of quality, unconventional. But there are people, I think, who probably shouldn't be listening to music that is actually reinforcing maybe violent tendencies or stereotypes. They may be suffering from depression and this might reinforce those feelings. So it's tricky, I think. Does the enjoyment of this sort of music indicate that some people might just be wired differently to the way they receive it? Or is it that they've been exposed to different things in different social groups over time? That's a fascinating question because I have a colleague who's a neuroscientist in, in um, he's now at Bergen University, Stefan Kulch, and he's done a lot of work on music in the brain. And when I talked to him about death metal and violent music, that was his interpretation. He said, I think that there's something different about their brains. That's not my view. <laughs> I don't think that there's anything different about their brains. I just think that they are have maybe slightly different personalities that are open to very different genres of music, music that is unlike other forms of music. A lot of people appreciate the sense of community in in extreme metal because they have a, a fairly tight community and there's a sort of sense of if you're an insider you get it you understand uh, what's going on we uh, another it's kind of surprising finding for me was that these fans of extreme metal tend to have higher levels of music background than fans of other genres maybe with the exception of say you know, high art classical music, but they tend to have music training. And it, it's understandable in retrospect because the music really goes against conventional songwriting. It, it breaks so many conventions. It doesn't have a kind of verse, chorus, verse. It, there tends to be different segments. Each segment of music can change quite dramatically in tempo, in style. The pitch sequences that are used tend to be somewhat atonal, so that it's not, you know, adhering to normal conventional tonality in music. So it has a number of features that make it really innovative, but there is that violent element to it, which, which sort of adds some other questions. Mirren has a good old chat with us in the episode called The Science of Changing Your Thinking, where she talks about brain structure and how it works. And she's got the scientific juice on what happens in the brain at the physiological level that causes us to experience pleasure. And as it turns out, music is a regular player. What's happening in the brain from that perspective that's going on that's causing us that pleasure? Yeah, so there's a very um, sophisticated network in the brain um, and it's part of this dopaminergic system. So this is a system that's heavily sort of oriented or geared to dopamine, which is one of the main neurotransmitters in the brain. And so the network that's implicated when we do experience those feelings of pleasure, like, you know, the tingles when you hear your favourite tune, and um, there are regions in the front of the brain, in the frontal lobe, and then there are regions in an area deep inside the brain called the striatum. And collectively, they are sort of like these hedonic hotspots is the term that's used in the literature. So they fire or activate when we respond in that pleasurable way to a stimulus. So if you're you know, biting into, you know, a lovely warm slice of pizza or something. These are the regions that will get activated in the brain. And so they, they um, 
largely are driven by this dopaminergic neurotransmitter. And it's what gives us these feelings of pleasure. And it's very reinforcing. So it actually, we will remember those feelings in response to a stimulus. And also we can anticipate and look ahead to sort of think ahead and sort of plan out how we might actually work towards and achieve other similar rewards. Ever heard of rhythmic synchronization? Well, I hadn't until we had a conversation <laughs> with Bill about it when we had a chat. I was going to ask you about the unpredictableness because um, one of the other things that come up is what rhythmic synchronization, which is, is why we like music. Can you explain that better? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of music, there's a detectable beat or a pulse to the music. People naturally tend to move to music. And in fact, when you play music to people, if they're just sitting still, you'll find a lot of activity in the motor cortex of the brain. So it directly stimulates the motor cortex. So that's why if you feel like tapping to music or clapping to music, that's because your motor cortex is sort of activated. It's like, let's do something. Uh, we've got all this music uh, here. And synchronizing to music is something that not many animals can do. Humans can do it. Um, and, and other, you know, bird species can do it and, and some other animals, but it's, it's kind of rare to be able to, to synchronize very tightly with the beat of music. And in synchronizing with music, you're synchronizing with each other as well. And when you synchronize with each other, with other people, you naturally start to feel connected to those people. It's as if you lose your sense of individuality and you start to have a kind of group identity. And so that's why, you know, in football games, you see people doing these rhythmic chants and so forth, because it actually does create genuine team spirit, a sense of strong connection, a sense that you're all part of the same thing. And, and that actually has been studied quite a lot in the neuroscience of music, this idea of synchronization leading to a greater sense of coherence in the group, greater cooperation, greater sense of trust of the other people in the group, even if you don't even know them, and, and a kind of loss of a sense that you're just one individual. So one of the, the things that stood out is that you said rhythmic synchronization allows the brain to plan ahead. So is that a process of because your brain is anticipating where that next beat is coming from, it's almost creating another pathway as it's going? I think so. I mean, I, when you think of music, you think of, we often think of memory, like, you know, the music that you remember best and, and the meaning of, a, of a, an individual note or a beat is only meaningful in, with reference to what's just happened. So what's happened before, but what's often not discussed is just what you said, what you're thinking is going to happen. When you've got a rhythmic template, you know that that beat is coming up. And so you can plan ahead and you can anticipate it. And there seems to be uh, a real sense of satisfaction in knowing that the beat is coming up and being able to synchronize with it. So in something like that death metal or more avant-garde stuff where the beat isn't necessarily predictable, is that one of the reasons why we hate it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Um, I once gave a talk on extreme metal and I was looking at the, the movements of people in mosh pits, you know, so, you know, the mosh pit is where people are running around and they're often knocking into each other. In some cases, they actually, you know, cause slight damage. You see people with some blood running down their face. Well, you know, sort of talking about the mosh pit and saying that it, it really isn't the same as synchronization or dancing. And one of the people in the audience who was a fan of death metal raised his hand. He said, no, he said, that is dancing. He said, that is quite simply, that's dancing. But for me, it's a different form of dancing because it is not, it's not synchronized in a close sense with any metric structure. And the rhythmic aspects of extreme metal tend to involve kind of machine gun style percussion. Part of its innovation is that it doesn't fall into conventional metric structure with a simple beat. So it would be very hard to synchronize closely with death metal. But I think fans feel that they are, in fact, um, synchronizing maybe in a different way uh, to the music. Bill, I want to have a look at the um, the notion of the autobiographical memories that um, music is associated with. I've worked um, closely with people living with dementia for a part of my career. 
And one particular memory that comes back, which wasn't specifically related to music, but related to um, recitation of the Lord's Prayer. We had uh, somebody who we took to Mass, and generally um, they weren't someone who would verbalise very much, but as soon as they started saying the Lord's Prayer in Mass, they were instantly reciting it. So does that indicate with that sort of thing and with music that this is targeting a different part of the brain or it has a deeper connection in some way? It does seem that um, musical memory is remarkably preserved in the face of, of dementia where other forms of memory uh, seem to be damaged or lost. So uh, we have found that people with severe dementia who does, don't even know, for example, who their own son or daughter is, don't know what their own name is, don't know where they are. If you start a song, they'll be able to finish it. And so there's something about music that it's situated in part of the brain that is remarkably preserved in the face of widespread damage. But memory is subjective, which as a researcher deeply interested in the effects of dementia, Miran Irish explains. It brings me around to thinking about subjective nature of memory and uh, I wonder um, Miran, with the um, long-term memory so for example I can remember events as far back as when I was about three years old but I'll speak to other friends and they've got very patchy memory that probably only goes back to early adulthood am I making it up or is there something different going on in my brain to somebody else's trauma aside yeah so I mean that's another great question and I think in the past, you know, most of the memory studies were really focusing on trying to just understand like differences in terms of time periods. So how much detail can you remember in general from your school days? And then we have these like really lovely studies from 20, 30 years ago where they're showing that most people have um, this sort of phenomenon, which is called a reminiscence bump. And that generally occurs around the time of you know between 18 to say 30 years old and so most people will show preferential recall of events around that time and these if you think about it this makes sense because this is when most people traditionally would have been doing those kind of formative first experiences. So you would maybe have your, you know, doing your big exams, getting your first car, first job, maybe meeting your partner, first date, all this kind of thing, getting married, first child. So that tended to produce this sort of cluster of really memorable and sort of self-referential events that define the person. And so most people would retrieve from that time period. Now we know that in terms of the actual memory sort of architecture of the brain that most of the sort of machinery isn't really in place until we're about four or five and it's really interesting because it's around that same time that you see in children that they start to be able to start planning and thinking about the future as well as also understanding that there are consequences to actions and that other people might have a different um, set of thoughts feelings or you know motives compared to themselves. So there's this sort of um, conjunction of different um, cognitive skills and capacities that all emerge at the same time. And that's why most people will start recalling event-based memories or autobiographical memories from their past around the age of four or five. I mean, that said, you know, it's very possible that there are differences in different individuals. And we're also understanding more about the role of imagery and that some people just simply have a better ability to conjure up you know these images from their past whereas other people seem to engage in memory in a much more sort of verbal and um less of a visual style and I think we're only starting to get a handle on how individual differences just in the way we approach memory and re-experience memory is going to have a huge effect on even the time in which you can remember those events from. It's really interesting talking about um, the formative years where, you know, we kind of pick up those experiences of really being like those late teens to mm. early 20s. Um, as my previous career as a like a radio station music director, it would be the songs that always test really well with the demographic of people always come from that particular time. 
um, regardless of what their age was. If you look back at when their formative years was, those were the songs that are always, you, we want to hear those, we want to hear more of those over and over again instead of favouring something newer. What does that say about our ability to change as we get older? Yeah, and I think that's such a lovely point because if we think about some of the um, studies that have been done on music in dementia, for example, again, it always seems to be the music that comes from that pivotal sort of formative time. Um, They're the songs that resonate much more um, effectively in terms of calming the individuals, you know, promoting a sense of well-being and enabling them to actually delve back into memories that are intact and talk about memories and events that maybe family members or friends haven't actually ever heard of before because it's from a time prior to their birth even. Mm. So it's really powerful, this music evoked memory phenomenon that we see um, in the literature. I think as well, I mean, it makes sense if you think that, you know, you might have had your wedding dance to a certain song. It's going to have that emotional sort of stamp on it as well that will make it have a privileged encoding. So it's going to be more likely to that you'll respond to that in an emotional way rather than, you know, just hearing something in the car when you're driving to and from work every day because it's pinned back to a very specific, evocative and, you know, personally relevant event from your own time you know your autobiographical history bill tells us that music can actually be a doorway into our memories including people in the community who are living with dementia music can act as a doorway into your memories there was the case that we wrote about where a woman with severe dementia developed what we call capgras syndrome or delusion where she assumed that her husband of 60 years was an intruder and would chase him out of the house with a broom. But then he started singing a song that they shared together when they first met, Unchained Melody uh, by the Righteous Brothers. And through that, she started to recognize him again and and her memories returned. But he had to sing that song to her uh, basically every night and remind her that he was her husband of 60 years. Uh, and, and in his words, she came back. And it was quite a moving story, but it illustrates that not only is the musical memory preserved, but so are the associations. And sometimes music can be a window back uh, to those memories. You also mentioned using it for people with stroke, and that's a slightly different, I mean, it can be used for, for memories, but in the case of stroke, sometimes people lose their ability to speak, a condition known as non-fluent aphasia. And in that case, music can be a window back to speech production, because although speech is normally controlled in the left hemisphere, in an area of the brain known as Broca's area, the musical part of the brain also has some language capacity. And it's a sort of different part of the brain, but it has limited, but it does have language capacity. So you can have people who have had a stroke, have had conventional speech therapy that doesn't work. They may not be able to utter a single word for two years after the stroke. But when you ask them to sing a song, suddenly they can vocalize those words. And this has happened with a number of, of, of patients with non-fluent aphasia. It was only through sort of singing therapy, what we call melodic intonation therapy, that they were able to start to speak again. And that seems to trigger a process of recovery uh, that either the speech continues in the preserved right hemisphere in cases where the stroke has damaged the left hemisphere or their initial uh, speech, the success that they have with speech through singing will trigger some other process in which the areas around the damage in the brain will start to reconfigure and, and take control over speech. So it can be a really powerful uh, therapy for s many people, not all, not all respond to melodic intonation therapy, but about half of the people with stroke do respond well. And Mirren was able to shed a little bit more light on this in the context of dementia. For people living with dementia, is it more about the senses and trying to actually help them to just be in the moment? Yeah, I think there's a huge aspect of it um, in just constraining the experience to the present moment and taking the pressure off as well, as you said, to not have it 
as working towards an outcome, but actually the process in itself is just one of enjoyment and experience. And if we circle back to our opening kind of topic about pleasure, Mm. it's interesting because the studies that have been done on music in particular in dementia, in Alzheimer's disease, show that, um, you know, when we image the brain of people who have got Alzheimer's disease, that um, set of structures, that frontostriatal brain circuit that I was mentioning, doesn't appear to be as damaged as many of the memory structures or the spatial memory or the navigation structures are. And they remain preserved for a remarkably long time into the disease course. So it seems that if you can tailor the activity to the individuals with Alzheimer's disease, they can derive pleasure from those experiences through this circuit. And so that's been suggested to be one of the reasons maybe why music therapy and art therapy are so effective because that capacity to experience pleasure is still there. It's just finding the right key to unlock it, you know, using maybe personally relevant stimuli or personally relevant music. Um, So it's really interesting. And I think one of the things that I particularly like about music is that you can use these types of approaches in even the very severely impaired um, individuals living in, you know, assisted or residential aged care. They don't need to be able to, you know, communicate verbally, but more often than not, this approach will reach everyone. It's like the great sort of universal communicating tool. You'll find people who haven't spoken, being able to sway or tap or move along to the beat. And it just seems to be a very potent way of engaging again, even if it's non-verbally, but communicating back to people who have been, you know, unreachable for a time. So while Miran has told us about the physiological response in the brain when we experience pleasure, Bill expands on this, telling us what happens when we participate in music specifically. It used to be thought that when you listen to music or when you participate in music, basically it's all right hemisphere and language is left hemisphere. And it's since been shown that that's not really true, that in fact, the whole brain is involved in both listening to music and participating in music. The differences in brain activity between merely listening in a passive way to music and producing music are not so different. They're they're not huge differences. It's more a question of emphasis. If you're actively playing, say, the violin, then there's finger control and all sorts of bowing control. So there's mm, muscles that are being used and brain areas responsible for those muscles. But it's not as if listening passively to music is fundamentally different. When we listen to music, a lot of people um, have concluded that we are, in a sense, simulating that music in our minds. So the brain is activating the motor system in a way that's similar to actually producing that music. Okay, and that's it, it, this this idea started with the discovery of so-called mirror neurons in the brain. I don't know if you've heard of those, but this is the idea that when you perceive an action, the brain kind of simulates that action. And to to give you an example of how that might work, imagine you're at a soccer game and you're intensely interested in what happens and there's your favorite player just about to kick the ball and you kind of feel your leg moving a little bit because you want them to get that goal. (laughs) And uh, so intuitively, we do kind of simulate what we see in terms of actions and the same is true for listening to music. When we listen to music, part of us and part of our brain is simulating the production of that music. And that's why we love to clap, tap to music. It's our way of participating in the music making. Is this a similar thought to how I've heard athletes train, for example, they actually imagine that they're crossing the finish line rather than approaching the finish line to actually get that win? Is this a similar sort of thing where the brain actually mimics into reality or vice versa? Well, I I think so. It's, you know, imagination becomes very important in any kind of skill acquisition. And when you imagine yourself finishing, you know, something or crossing a finish line or achieving something, uh, you're doing a couple of things. One is you're simulating the pathway towards that goal, which is important because then when you actually go along that pathway, you've kind of already been there in your mind. And I think the second is really about developing uh, a sense of confidence. And, you know, so I think 
it probably performs multiple functions. And one is a neural function to simulate a pathway. But the second is really just to imagine what it's like so that you don't have any kind of mental blocks about accomplishing something that you want to accomplish. As it turns out, enjoyment of music isn't a simple passive exercise. It boosts imagination through repetition and anticipation. I think imagination plays a crucial role in music and how we experience it. And we're continuously uh, juxtaposing what we hear with what we imagine might happen. And if there's a deviation between what we imagine is the, the natural continuation of a melody, say, and what actually happens, that's usually quite poignant. And it usually adds a note of tension to the music that, that I think composers intentionally insert into music. And they play with our expectations of what's going to happen. And that's all about imagination and experience. And those two are intertwined in a way uh, that's kind of impossible to disentangle and helps to explain a lot of our experiences of music. The predictability of music, like that three minute 30 song, you know, that verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, key change, chorus. Does that bring us comfort because it is something that our brain is anticipating? Yes, I think anything that is conventional, anything that's familiar, anything that's repetitive does bring us comfort. And uh, there's a couple of points with that. One is that music contains an awful lot of repetition and it's it's something that that is uh, a hallmark of music is that often the same phrase is repeated endlessly you know you've got uh like songs by the beatles hey jude i'm thinking of you know it's repeated something i don't know 36 times some enormous number uh that you hear the same phrase over and over and over again and there is a kind of comfort in that and then the second thing that occurs to me i used to do a little bit of film scoring and if i was wanting to communicate fear, I would just veer away from anything that was kind of conventional because where you have unpredictability, you have uncertainty and in uncertainty, you can find fear and anxiety. So I think that there's, there is a lot of comfort. There's a lot of repetition. I think the repetition does more than bring comfort though. It makes the music special. It's a way of saying, this is important if you say it again. So, you know, if you, if you think of like a rose is a rose is a rose, you know, by saying it again and again, somehow it becomes special. And I think the same occurs with music. I mean, in, I suppose my experience is you have people like the Beatles pioneering that three and a half minute format. And then as time's gone on, it's almost like the verses, we don't need them anymore. We just need the hooks, just that the strongest part of the song. And now as technology moves on, more people have seem to have shorter attention spans. And so we've got a, a Vine slash TikTok culture now where we we just it's just like a seven second hook of a song and it's almost like we're chasing a little dopamine hit just to hear that next seven seconds and we only want seven seconds the best part of a song is it because we are chasing dopamine a lot of people have talked about the pleasure of music and they've likened music listening to you know the same part of the brain that's responsible for eating delicious food like chocolate or having sex or taking drugs. And to, to a certain extent, I think that's true, but I also feel like it's a little overstated and that I, you know, I think that there's different aspects of, of what we appreciate about music. And one is listening to the actual hook, uh, listening to that, that very pleasurable moment in music. But there's also, we also appreciate the artist. We, we appreciate where the music's coming from, who that person is, what gave rise to that music. And we also appreciate what the music means for us personally. So we've got sort of three things. We've got like our identity, what it, music tells us about ourselves, who the artist is or the context of the music making. Is it music that has indigenous roots or is it music that, you know, is, is kind of folk music? Uh, what does it mean? Uh, and then we've got the actual sound. I agree that there has been a tendency for a lot of artists to focus on that hook, but not all. You know, I'm thinking of, say, a song like um, Daniel Caesar's Best Part. You know that song? Uh, uh, maybe not. But OK, well, uh, he, has, he ends this song. He goes through a whole long line of the song, which is quite a beautifully rendered song. 
And then the, the, the last part is kind of the hook where he, he says in the lyrics, if you love me, won't you say something? And then he says, if you love you, won't, won't you? And then he stops. And then he, he continues in that way. And, th and then it finishes the song. And that last moment, it's so beautifully done that you're kind of waiting for it for the entire song. And then when he gets to it, and when you see him give concerts, the entire audience is singing it along with him in this particular moment. And it's really a joyous moment. But I think it wouldn't be so joyous if he just started with that line. <laughs> it, just, it, would, it, it wouldn't be the same thing. It's the anticipation and, and moving gradually to this pivotal moment that I think makes it so special. Apart from giving us pleasure or motivating us, music has therapeutic benefits, which Mirren has observed in her studies on people living with dementia. Is it more useful then to use music that the individual was actually more closely linked to or is there a particular type of music that's more effective? Yeah so I think this comes back to the whole idea of you know a Mozart effect or if there's you know one universal type of music that you know trumps them all but I think probably the best approach is to tailor it to the individual because you will find that you know people have such different styles in terms of their affinity or even their exposure to different types of music depending on their cultural background or socioeconomic economic background um, and I think as we've kind of said earlier you can unlock memories by tailoring it to the time period from when the individual was most likely to be experiencing these kind of formative events and that in itself is a huge boost for people who are living with Alzheimer's when many of those older episodes are actually still accessible if you have the right tool to get there. So I think personally sort of tailored music is very, very useful in the context of dementia. But we know that there are some um, pieces that are, are actually quite useful in terms of just playing soothing and calming classical music. But I mean, for every person that we say it might work with, there might be someone else who actually doesn't like that type of music. So mm. I think it's always best to tailor it probably to the individual. Is that something that we can access without Alzheimer's dementia? Like now, is it something we can pull into our toolkit if we're experiencing anxiety or um, any kind of emotion similar to that? Can we create our own shortcutted playlists to access more pleasurable, calming feelings for ourselves? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting interesting idea that we might have a little sort of almost like a, a survival kit where if we're in a really distressing you know or at work if you're overly stressed or something that you could have your sort of go-to playlist that you know will calm you I mean there's always the worry that you might end up habituated to the music or that you might end up starting to associate the music with the stressful <laughs> circumstances so we don't want to you ruin the playlist <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> But I think that it's a good point because I think at the moment, everybody is very overworked, stressed, overburdened, and we can't connect the way we used to. So we should actually be thinking about how do we develop a little toolkit? And it could be music, it could be, I don't know, mindfulness, exercise, but just strategies that we know we can sort of pull out when we need them. And I think that's something that a lot of people probably would benefit from. One of the things I was thinking about with music then is that sometimes a song can kind of act as a shortcut, uh, I suppose, and maybe that's a shortcut in the brain as well with a new neural pathway. So I'm wondering if we can, could we consciously create those? You know, you, you hear a song, it instantly reminds you of that time that you felt good getting married. Could we consciously try and associate one type of cue to elicit that response? It's definitely possible. And there's a, a large literature on this idea of conditioning where you gradually pair one stimulus with another outcome or response so that over time it becomes a sort of an automatic, automatic or reflexive response. Whether we could actually consciously do this and then make sure that our response was the same every time, I'm not so sure because people change and, you know, our feelings change from one moment to the next. And we might hear, you know, the wedding song on one day, but be in a particularly bad mood with your spouse and then think, oh, God, I, you know, <laughs> I can't believe I loved dancing to this. It's, we're, we're so variable that it's it's very hard to predict you know, hard and fast kind of set of rules that we could roll out um, across all contexts. And I think that's one of the great things about studying, you know, human cognition is that there's so many different variables that go into the mix and can change. And we change over time as well. 
that if it was as easy as just, you know, oh, if we press play, then this will elicit this response, we'd be kind of reduced back to almost Pavlovian dogs, you know, just salivating mm. at the bell. But, you know, we're far more complex than that. So is music one of those tools that we can use? Because we've had some conversations with some other um, psychologists along the way, some other researchers as well. And the indication is that music is one of those things that activates across all parts of the brain. As a tool, is it something that can actually then help to take advantage of some of the brain's plasticity? Yeah, so I think there's a number of benefits of music. I mean, it's one of these things that we share across all cultures and all societies. So it seems to be almost a universal platform that humans just naturally derive pleasure from, but also communicate through. Um, and so the fact that we know we can, you know, you can use music with infants, pre-verbal, all the way up to adults who have aphasia or who have dementia. And so it's a, a very sort of nice conduit in a sense to try and access or to communicate or engage with people who may not otherwise have that chance. But I think in terms of, for example, Alzheimer's disease, we know that music has a very um, important anxiety reduction mechanism. And so one of the um, earliest studies that I actually ever conducted, we found that music had an enhancing effect on the ability to retrieve memories from the past. And we had tried all of these other different um, tasks to see was music, you know, boosting attention or was it increasing arousal? was a decreasing anxiety. And the thing that emerged as driving the sort of facilitatory effect of music on memory was actually an anxiety reduction mechanism. So it seemed that by us playing just soothing and um, calming music, it was orchestral Vivaldi's Four Seasons in the background. This had a very nice dampening effect on the agitation and the anxiety that our Alzheimer patients were sort of experiencing and it actually enabled them to recall events from their past in much greater detail. Um, and so this has been replicated across a number of different studies now. And it seems that if you can tailor it right, and this you know, speaks to the importance of like this sort of person centric approach, then it could be a very useful tool to enable, to calm individuals, maybe to distract from a distressing experience um, or to reorient them if they're feeling unsettled. Even if we're not impacted by something like dementia or other neurodivergent factors, music therapy can have its upside. Can we use music as a tool to, I suppose, help ourselves feel better in those situations and alleviate some of those kind of symptoms? Music therapy has been around for quite a long time now. And I think the first music therapy association was somewhere like in the 40s, uh, the 1940s. It's used in different ways and to to varying benefits. But one technique is to use music as a kind of window into the imagination and to trying to work through difficult feelings. So it can be a stimulus for discussion and for kind of deeper understanding of, of who you are as a person and, and perhaps why you may have the feelings that you do. Another way that music has been used to address uh, depression is through mood management. So for some people, if, there's, if they have really difficult feelings, it might help them to listen to extreme metal music with violent themes because it's a way of affirming their feelings and working through those feelings and in some cases discharging those feelings. And that kind of process of discharging can sometimes be beneficial. I think it's important for the therapist to evaluate the individual and to evaluate whether certain types of music might be beneficial or might not be so beneficial. In some cases, it might be helpful to play sad music to somebody to affirm their feelings of sadness and to, they, they won't feel so alone in these experiences. They'll recognize that, that there are other people that share their experiences. They'll feel a stronger sense of connection. But for other people, it may just nurture kind of rumination and they might end up dwelling on their sad feelings 
in a way that's not very adaptive. So it's, I, I think it's very important for uh, any music therapist to assess such factors and any good mu music therapist would be able to do that. I mean, music therapy is not my particular background, but that's my understanding um, of, of how music therapy works. And, and it is important to, to acknowledge that there's no one size fits all. I wanted to explore the other side of that thought, Bill, with you and, and talk about things like music with poker machines and how it's used in shopping centers about the, the effectiveness of music as an anchor I guess, to, to bring about certain behaviors or certain ways of being for people. There's a lot of music that's imposed on us in society. And so we get music in shopping centers or in, in, in individual shops, in elevators. Um, and, and sometimes it's there for a reason that's quite generic, such as to ensure that people are relaxed or to um, establish uh, an ambiance that you you want to establish, you know, this is a fancy restaurant and so we're playing classical music, we're not playing folk. There is clear evidence that music does manipulate us. You know, there, there was a study done by uh, one individual to show that people are actually willing to pay more for bottles of wine when the music in the background is fancy pants music than if it's just like, you know, teenage kind of folk music. <laughs> so we actually, you know, even smart people will be manipulated in subtle, unconscious ways by the music around us. But I also think that, that in, for some of us, it's an irritant. So, you know, I think it's important for institutions like aged care facilities to not assume that any music is going to be beneficial for everybody, because for some people, it would be an intrusion. If music is able to manipulate us, can we manipulate the manipulation of the music to our benefit, ourselves? <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. So so the fact that music has an impact on us and it, it, it has both explicit effects on us and, and sometimes implicit ones uh, means that we can muse, use music to manage our emotions. Um, and uh, one sociologist, Tia Denora, has called this emotion work. She, she uh, has actually described music listening as a kind of work where we're working on ourselves and managing our emotions. And a lot of people have, have looked at how, the different strategies that people use to manage their emotions using music. For example, we might need more energy we might be cleaning the house and we just yes. feel like, oh gosh, I think I need a bit more energy. So I'm going to put on some upbeat music and then I'll finish the cleaning. Or we might need to calm down. We've just had a very stressful meeting or interaction with somebody and we just want to calm down and play something that's, that's gentle and soothing. Or we might want affirmation of a disappointment or sadness in our lives and we might listen to sad music and share in that sadness. So people use different forms of music to manage their emotions in different ways. Usually it's effective, but in the world of music therapy, a therapist's job is to ensure that those mood management strategies are optimal mm -hmm. and aren't inadvertently going in the wrong direction. For example, leading to rumination. Neurochemicals that are involved, such as dopamine, which can make us feel positive and satisfied and lacking anxiety and comfortable. And then, of course, the noradrenaline, you know, adrenaline system, which is about how much energy we feel. Those two neurochemicals on their own, I mean, there are other ones, but those two on their own can explain an awful lot because you've got kind of valence on the one side, whether something is positive and then energy. And when you combine those, you can actually generate a lot of distinct emotions. You also have um, chemicals, uh, hormones such as oxytocin, Cotin, and you've got stress hormones that are affected by music as well. Uh, cortisol, for example. If you are engaged in group singing, cortisol levels seem to go down. That means that your stress, overall stress levels, have been reduced. So you get all of these chemical markers of what's going on psychologically. So if we're feeling stressed, join a choir? Exactly. Joining a choir does actually uh, reduce stress. Uh, one of my PhD students, um, Gemma Perry, uh, is working on group chanting. So chanting meditation and chanting mm -hmm. is a practice 
that occurs all around the world in various different traditions, religious traditions, spiritual traditions. There's a good reason for that because group chanting causes a very significant reduction in cortisol, which is a stress hormone, but also nurtures a sense of connectedness to other people, both people in the same group who you may or may not know, but also a sense of connectedness to people in general. So people feel connected to the world globally when they engage in this sort of synchronous chanting practice. I've been to, I think, more concerts than the average person ever may experience in their lifetime. I mean, at, at some point I was going to big concerts three, four times a week. When I listen to music, some music I hate now because I've heard it so many times, so the repetition doesn't bring me comfort. Sometimes I feel those positive emotions when I listen to the recording, but every time Time, pretty much when I went to the concert, even if it was an artist who I've heard so many times now that I could not stand to listen to anymore, when I'm in a live environment like that, I almost always walk out feeling joy and appreciation and overwhelmed with, um, I don't know, it's, it's just so much passion and I'm so grateful to have been a part of that experience. And I think that speaks to something that you were talking about, like this kind of collectiveness and this kind of community that comes together in in a group like that to create that kind of an experience. Is it just a oxytocin overload when you get 50,000 people in the same stadium all singing the same lyrics at the same time? I agree with you. When I go to a live concert, I have a much richer experience. And, and I think for me, there's a number of reasons for that. And one is the sense of community that you have, uh, the sense that you're all doing something in a collective way and celebrating together. In some cases, you're synchronizing, if not literally by clapping, your attentional systems are synchronized in the sense you're, you're all attending in the same way to the same moments in time. The entire stadium, in some cases, they're all synchronized in how they're listening. Uh, so that's really important. The other aspect to think about is that if we imagine what the origins of music were, and, and why we have music as an, a species and how it functions. We have to acknowledge that the idea of music as pure sound and only sound really only emerged with the invention of the gramophone. <laughs> and, you know, so that's when suddenly the sonic aspect of music became disconnected from the context in which it occurred. There may have been hints of that, you know, with the emergence of concerts, I don't know, in the 19th century, but really the invention of the gramophone was where there was this absolute separation between the sound of music and the context of music making. And I think that for, for most people, the whole audiovisual embodied experience is much richer than a disembodied sonic experience where you're simply listening you can imagine, you can use your imagination, it's still a rich experience, but it can't compete with watching the performer, watching the performer's movements, watching the joy and the emotional responses of, of, of the musicians and the people around you. All of that contributes to a much richer experience. So I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I love live concert. In the absence of uh, another sound, I suppose, for me to tap along to, I often find myself kind of self-generating my own rhythmic sound, like whether I just tap away at something or I'm moving my foot involuntarily. It almost forms a rhythm. Is that related to my brain's need to, going back to that rhythmic synchronization, organization to plan ahead? If, if we don't have music to listen to, are we kind of generating our own? It's interesting that you say that I'm just going to make some random associations, but one is I remember reading a, a research study showing that each person has their own kind of natural tapping rate. You know, if you just ask them to tap at any rate that they feel like tapping, uh, there'll be individual differences. And some people will be naturally kind of fast tappers and other people be naturally slower. So we each have our own kind of internal natural pace that seems to say something about ourselves as an individual. So, you know, I don't know whether yours is a little yeah, bit um, my, my metronome frenetic. is ticking, uh, yeah, like 140 <laughs> BPM, I think. Machine gun drumming type <laughs> That's stuff. Right. I'm almost at death metal level, I think, with my metronome. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you're impatient. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair statement too. <laughs> 
but yeah, there was something else I was going to say, but I've, I, it, I've, it slipped my mind. Um, so you were saying, yeah, that just the tapping that. Yeah. Like do, are, are we kind of creating our own music if we, because music helps us to process and feel if we haven't got music to listen to or to be a part of a group that's doing it, are we doing it on our own? Maybe unconsciously. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that I, I think that you probably are. I, I remember um, I had a, 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 a student of mine who was also taking jazz at the same time as he was doing a master's degree in psychology. And I was asking him about what the jazz teacher told him. And he said that the jazz teacher told him to go around all day, just snapping his finger at a certain rate and just sort of think of a kind of beat I found that really hilarious. I just uh, had this image of him going around snapping his finger, but he just said that the the concept was really just to sort of find your own sense of of rhythm generated internally, and that the music will kind of come naturally once you have that very strong embodied sense of rhythm. Because of the way the brain works, and it encodes uh, experiences. In, in terms of neural connections, basically you've tattooed your brain you've with that song. And so it's not surprising that it occasionally will make itself known because there's a tattoo in your brain of that melody. And, but there's another um, aspect to uh, songs being stuck in your head that I think might be important. And that is where it's called the Zagarnik effect. It's a fun, it, and it was a guy whose last name was Sigarnik. But at any rate, he showed that when you're given problems or scenarios that have not been solved, so they're incomplete, the mind will dwell on that more than if you've completed that problem. So if you've completed the problem, you can say, okay, I've completed it, I can forget about it. But if you haven't completed it, the brain just sort of goes along. And so there's a sense in which some songs get stuck in your head because you can't remember the ending or there's something about it that's kind of incomplete. So you're singing this phrase mm. and you're not quite sure how to continue it to its conclusion. I don't know if, if that is the case. And it, it with you may have much better song memory than most of us, but a lot of us can only really remember basically um, the chorus and the verses we're not entirely sure about. And so we, you know, we have this kind of incomplete fragment of music in our heads and it's going along and it stops at a certain point because we can't finish it. And then it starts again. And no, we can't finish it again. And it starts again. <laughs> so I recommend listening to the music and trying to finish it <laughs> as a way of getting rid of those. <laughs> I've also heard a theory that um, if you try to sing the song to the tune of Gilligan's Island theme, that it will break that pattern. <laughs> you reckon about that? Yes, I think that's a good point. You know, you could you could sing some other. Oh, so you mean sing the same lyrics with the Gilligan's Island? Yeah, sing the lyrics to the Gilligan's Island theme. Oh, yeah, that's fascinating. I think that's a really. I don't know who said that, but it makes a lot of sense because a lot of the reason for the strong neural encoding of music is because of the coupling of the lyrical memory with the musical memory that might, you know, break the cycle in some way. That's interesting. Maybe I'll just um, set up your next research paper. <laughs> yes, that's right. I'll put a student <laughs> onto that immediately. <laughs> And here I was thinking that these songs keep popping into my head because maybe my brain's trying to tell me something that I haven't thought of yet. Yeah, I find it happens to me when I'm tired um, more. But it also sometimes I'm just really interested in that song and I, I can't get enough of it. And so in some cases, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I, I actually like the song um, and, and enjoy it but I don't really enjoy the song being stuck in my head. In other cases, it's an annoying song. I don't know, like a Justin Bieber hook that you just can't get out of your head. And you're not particularly a Justin Bieber fan, but it's just, it's a, it's a, a hook. And the reason it's a hook is because it gets stuck in people's head. If repetition tattoos our brain and it's easier to tattoo our brain with music, could we change 
our thought patterns and brain by consciously putting beliefs into a musical format and then repeating them over and over again to ourselves until they become our internal tune. There's a really interesting connection between music and beliefs. And one of the connections is that a lot of music has functioned historically in religious ceremonies. And connection between music and spiritual beliefs is really strong. And I think that there's a reason for that. One is that music is a lot like language in the sense that it unfolds over time. It implies meaning without actually presenting that meaning in an explicit way. And so anything that's accompanying that music, I think we take seriously. And you think of, say, the the 60s with the peace movement and Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell and all of those sort of folk singers that Really, their music led to large followings of people who shared those beliefs and and took what they said very seriously. When music um, is accompanied by lyrics, we tend to take those lyrics quite seriously. We think of them as having a, a lot of meaning, even if when we read those lyrics outside of the musical context, they're often a little bit trite, <laughs> to say the least, in some cases, you know, like platitudes. But in the context of a song, they really seem powerful. So I agree. I think that you could actually use music in a way, just as singers have throughout history, that helps to shape people's beliefs um, in ways that might be beneficial. I mean, so it's, you know, music can manipulate and it can be used for good purposes or it can be used for not so good purposes. Does it help us learn playing music, I suppose, even in the background? Does it help our brain process information better? A lot of people have studied whether music that accompanies another cognitive activity will either support that activity, for example, nurture better learning, or interfere with that activity. So if we're involved in something that requires intense attention and we play let's say, death metal or thrash metal <laughs> yes. in the background probably isn't going to be helpful. <laughs> You're probably going to uh, find it distracting. On the other hand, it does provide another kind of association. So if you're, you're playing music that is kind of background music, it's not attracting too much of your attention, then it can be helpful to use music. But it, it really depends on the individual and on your, your musical background and also on how you listen to music, what you're used to doing when you're listening to music. For myself, when I listen to music, I can't help but pay attention to it. And <laughs> yes. it's really annoying. I just can't have it as background wallpaper. I wish I could, but if I'm even if I'm reading a novel, if music's in the background, I'm constantly sort of shifting over to the music and listening to it and losing concentration on the book. So my own experience is that I I prefer not to have music on if I'm involved in some other task that I care about. It's funny you say that in in my years of scheduling music for radio stations, I could not listen to music while I did the music scheduling. Otherwise, it was too much. I could put on an audio book and be completely engaged in a fantasy world and do both of those tasks at the same time, but put some music on and I couldn't focus on the other task anymore. It's remarkable how little it interferes with a lot of tasks. So we all know that we can drive pretty well Mm. while listening to music. And in fact, uh, driving is the new concert hall. I mean, it's sort of like the modern day concert hall of music. It's where most people listen to music. It's where most music is consumed is in a car um, these days, unfortunately, but that's just reality. And it doesn't really interfere. And for most people, it doesn't interfere with reading. People often listen to music while they're studying, and it doesn't really have much of an effect. One of the uh, studies that we did in our lab showed that it's really only if you have really fast and loud music that it starts to interfere with a comprehension of written material. So if you give people kind of dense material to read and to try to comprehend, and then you ask some comprehension questions later, music doesn't really have any negative effects unless it's loud and fast, in which case it's distracting and comprehension just sort of decreases. When it comes to the physical side of things as well, like it's helping people move their bodies It makes it easier for us to exercise, doesn't it? Yes. Um, In fact, I'm just starting a new project that is basically a four-year project on music-supported exercise. And Mm. and one of the big findings in the last sort of 30 years 
is just how beneficial exercise is for healthy aging and for the preservation of our cognitive capacities and our physical capacities, obviously, not surprisingly. But I think that music plays a role and has a, has a big role to play as well because it offers something over and above pure exercise. For one thing, it motivates people to exercise because people can move with the music and it can, it can be a way of motivating them to do something that would be otherwise kind of boring. But it also offers a sense of community, emotion management, and the neurochemical changes that are associated with listening to music that, that are also beneficial. So I think those two in combination are really powerful. One of the things I wrote down that I wouldn't have expected was dance has shown to provide significantly greater protective benefits against cognitive and physical decline than physical exercise alone. Yes, I think that's just, that is wonderful to hear and it makes perfect sense. And um, I think uh, we should all take up dancing uh, as embarrassing as it might be (laughs) to us. Uh, um, I actually believe that dancing has a major benefits. And so I, I, a, a few years ago, I signed up to a, a buchata uh, dancing um, class that I, I took for about six months or something like that. And it turned out to be kind of a pickup joint. Like I, I just wasn't expecting it. I kind of knew that it, that, it, you know, that it was quite sensual dancing, but I wasn't expecting it to be that much of, uh, of, of a, a salacious kind of atmosphere, but it was really fun. And I did learn um, a lot of good buchata moves. You don't have to be good at this dancing to get these benefits, do you? Well, I don't <laughs> think so. I mean, I, I guess, I guess the, it, it, it depends on the individual. If you feel that you're clumsy and that you're being, you know, judged by others, I suppose, you know, it probably, it wouldn't be good. So you need to be in a supportive environment. That's a really interesting idea. Now I'm wondering how I can manipulate myself. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that, <laughs> that I, I quite like the, the chanting uh, ritual because there you've got a meaningless, uh, usually you can, you can have something that has meaning, but if, you, if you're chanting a mantra, then you're not manipulating your beliefs necessarily. You're just letting the music do its work and the collective nature of, of chanting, the group nature, do its good without the lyrics, I don't know, complicating your thoughts in any way. But I, I'd say that if you, if you wanted to have the lyrics do something that was positive, they would just be affirming lyrics, something that, that tells you things are going to be okay, that, that, you know, or that you can achieve what you want to achieve, uh, that you're a good person. <laughs> Anything like that, when it's accompanied by music, is going to be positive, and it'll have a, a subconscious effect, even if you, on a conscious level, you recognize that it's on, they're only lyrics. But I, you know, I think that, that it triggers imagery in the brain uh, and unconscious processes that link the music with our beliefs. And I don't even have to be a good musician. I just have to take part in it. Well, I, that's, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think that the, the concept of a good musician is a kind of sinister aspect of Western societies. It, it's what puts so many people off participating in musical activities, you know, and even people who are good musicians, because they, there's such an emphasis on expertise and what it means to be a good musician that if somebody says, oh, oh, play us a song on the guitar, even for a good musician, they might, oh, no, no, I don't want to, no thanks, you know, I'd rather not. That's typical. And I think that's a, a problem with Western societies that we place so much emphasis on the distinction between the expert and the non-expert, that a lot of people just don't bother to participate in musical activities, aside from a passive way, which is still fine. There are many other societies globally where participating in music is just a normal part of life and everybody participates. Well, I think what you've inspired me to to do today, Bill, is to go and um, crank the music up and jump around my lounge room. I think that's going to be a good... (laughs) I think that's a good idea, and I might do the same. (laughs) How does it impact your your life, your your actual day-to-day life? Like, what what are you doing with music to take all these tools and put them into action? I have a piano, and I've got a guitar, and and I, I, I tend to... 
do a couple of things with both. Uh, with the piano, I, A, I do set myself challenges. They're not really significant challenges, but they're just like, oh, I think I'll learn this new piece. And I'll spend a few weeks learning some new piece. And I'll learn it to a point where I feel that I, you know, I can appreciate it. I can get the emotional qualities out of it. It can affect me in a positive way. And then I'll move on to another. So I get that sort of sense of, of trying to nurture skill and, and engage with, with what's involved in, in, in playing music. But I also just improvise on the piano in a really casual way. And I don't really put pressure on myself and I just explore. I mean, it could be as little as playing a three note pattern <laughs> with my left hand and then exploring a melody with my, I mean, it could be just vir virtually nothing that a, a five-year-old could do. Um, in fact, I used to teach piano to kids and they didn't find that a problem at all. I'd say, oh, let's make up a song, you know, just play these three notes over and over again and then try, they can do it. So anybody can do that kind of, of playing around with music. And I find that uh, really valuable. And it's just a way of helping you kind of just set aside all your worries and and just focus on something that's easy, pleasant, um, imaginative, um, and uh, it's like a time out for me. So those are a couple of things that I do. I do the same with the guitar. You know, I'm not a I'm not a particularly good guitarist, but I you can get a lot out of playing a few notes and and moving your hands around, and uh, and it can be pleasant. And, and creative. There's now quite a lot of concerts that are kind of geared towards people with profound hearing loss. It's something that there's more awareness of is that people with hearing loss can actually extract a lot of the elements of a music experience that people with a typical hearing get. And it's through the vibrations, of course, and through the vibrations will give you all the rhythmic information, the spectral information, the sort of variation in pitch is going to be severely uh, limited, but you're going to get some of that as well. There are a number of famous deaf musicians who have taught uh, other musicians, other people with profound hearing impairment to feel a uh, musical sound through their body, through the vibrations in the skin, and to learn to, to distinguish different pitches, different types of timbres, different instruments. And it's about attending to the right experience. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, that it's really important that we don't exclude people with hearing uh, loss and hearing impairment from the experience of music and don't just assume that, oh, well, they can't hear, so therefore music is not relevant to them because it is still relevant. And, and, and I think there's, there's greater awareness of that, which is wonderful. If there's one thing, the most important thing that you wish people knew about music and how it can enhance their connection, their lives, what would it be? Boy, that's a really hard question to, 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 to narrow it down to a single element. But I guess, I guess probably the most important point to make is that music is not just entertainment. <laughs> it, that's not all it is. It's, you know, it might feel entertaining, but it has a profound effect on virtually everything about us as human beings, about how we relate to other people, how we see ourselves, about our psychological well-being, and it can have genuine impact on, on the brain, and it can be used in, as treatments for neurological impairment. So music is much more than mere entertainment. It can, it can have profound effects on individuals and on society. And where would you tell people to start? I don't think people should change what they're doing. <laughs> so I just think that if, if there's greater awareness of, of, of what music is doing and how it impacts upon themselves and society, then if there needs to be changes in how people are consuming music, then I think that would occur naturally. But, you know, for the most part, people subconsciously gravitate to music that's doing them some good. Not always, but for the most part. And so, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's important not to judge people. Prejudice is something that is done a lot in music. And so if people, if you see people who are enjoying thrash metal, don't judge, don't, don't say, oh gosh, they must be horrible people. 
that's not helpful. <laughs> you don't understand why they're listening to that music, what they're getting out of it, what their experiences are. So, you know, I guess recognizing that, that music has functions, psychological functions, it has neurological effects, it has effects on our emotional states. Starting there is a good place. And then how you interact with music and, and how music affects you in your lives, that will, I think, come naturally. Next time on Reframe of Mind, we chat to someone who is a master at reframing her experiences to live, love and learn when we meet the unique Lucy Bloom, who instead of focusing on what could go wrong, simply asks, what could go right? I almost fantasise about the best case scenario because I have just as much control over that. <laughs> You've been hearing our story and now we really want to hear yours. Connect with at Reframe of Mind on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and Twitter. Or connect with at Welcome Change Media on LinkedIn. You can also contact us via reframeofmind.com.au with your stories or suggestions for future topics. We'd like to thank today's guests for sharing their personal stories and insights. For more information on any of the subjects, guests or references used in this episode, please see our show notes or reframeofmind.com.au. Reframe of Mind is a Welcome Change Media production.